Hello. No? Hey, how's it going? We're going to do ASP.NET MVC now, so follow me. I'm going over here. <laughs> All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to my talk on ASP.NET MVC 3. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about beginner stuff, but we'll move up to advanced very quickly. This is a good talk if you're getting started with ASP.NET. We'll show you um, what the difference is between MVC and web forms and web pages, how it all fits together. We'll talk about things like NuGet, and hopefully it'll be a lot of fun for everyone. Let's start up. All right, so <clears throat> when someone says the Microsoft web platform, what do they mean? We're talking about IIS, the web server, SQL Server, SQL Server Express, SQL Server Compact, Entity Framework and all of the things involved, and I'll talk about those. ASP.NET, which is the core base that everything sits on, and then things like JavaScript, jQuery, and then what used to be called the AJAX Control Toolkit. You'll hear people talk about Microsoft Web Platform or the Web Platform Installer. The name of the team that I work for is called Web Platform and Tools. So all of these things together comprise the Microsoft Web Platform. One of the things that I always try to point out to people who are getting started with things like MVC is that ASP.NET is greater than MVC. Sometimes people think that it's the new thing and I should learn that. I've done web forms for years. Now everyone talks about MVC because it's new and sexy. I'm going to talk and switch my job to MVC. Well, it's important to remember that web forms, MVC, and now what are called web pages or inline script are all built on top of ASP.NET. The view engines that we use to create our markup are used between these different versions. You can see that ASP.NET MVC can be both the web forms view engine and the Razor view engine, but it's so important to remember that all of that sits on top of ASP.NET. Membership and caching and session and provider models and the web config and the pipeline and HTTP handlers and modules and all of the different things that you'll learn about when you start working in ASP.NET is not part of MVC. MVC, web pages and web forms are just different ways to structure your application. Ultimately, we're just going to create HTML and we're going to use a different way to generate those angle brackets. Rather than feeling like you need to pick one, rather than feeling like it's a technology fork in the road and I have to be only a web forms person or only an MVC person, I like to look at it as a toolbox. It's a toolbox where different tools are right for the job. I did a charity job on the side recently. I used web forms because I needed some data grids and some binding and it was simple. I do MVC mostly in my day job. And then when I created the website with Rob Connery for our new podcast, This Developer's Life, we did it with web pages because it was lightweight and fun and we wanted to use the new free web matrix tool. I didn't feel like I was moving between three different technologies because it's ASP.NET that I was using and it's ASP.NET that makes it all happen. So important to remember that. Now, every ASP.NET MVC talk always shows either three circles or three boxes. And I don't understand why we typically do this because it doesn't tell me anything. And they always put them in our training material and they say, look, model, view, controller, as if the three boxes are somehow going to make it clear to you. And you'll say, oh, model, view, controller. Oh, thank you, three boxes. It's so clear now. The, the way that we really learn this is by doing. So that's how we're going to do it now. We're going to see what happens when you create an ASP.NET MVC application. So let's look at some demos. I'm going to fire up Visual Studio. Even though I'm using the paid version of Visual Studio, everything that I'm going to do today can be done for free. It's really important to know that. All of this stuff is free if you've got Windows. So if I go to the ASP.NET website, we recently updated this site for Mix. If I click on Getting Started, there's the three choices, Web Pages, Web Forms, and MVC. Underneath those are buttons. That big button there that says Install Visual Studio Express is actually a special button. It will automatically get you everything you need, the web server, the database tools, Visual Studio, all for free. But if you have a paid version 
of Visual Studio, it will automatically upgrade that one to the latest version. It will give you Service Pack 1. So that button is a smart button. It will use the web platform installer. And if you want to do web pages, you can download Web Matrix. Each of these three sections of the site include all new content, including a five-minute video by me that explains how things work, free videos from Pluralsight, and then on that right-hand side you see a, basically an entire book full of tutorials and information to learn on for each of these three things. So I would encourage you to check that stuff out. Let's make a new project, and we'll say ASP.NET MVC. Hit OK. I've got a choice to make an internet or intranet application. I'll select internet. I'm going to just keep HTML5 selected because it's the new stuff that everyone is using. And I'll hit OK, and this is going to create a default application. By default, we're going to get a couple of things. I'll run it and show you, and then we'll look at each of the sections. So I'm just going to run my site. Here's the default ASP.NET site. I've got a logon link, home and about. Everything works fine. Now, notice this URL here that says slash home slash about. It doesn't say .aspx or .php or anything. It's a pretty URL. When I say slash home slash about, that calls the home controller and the about method. If I add something here like public string, this is cool, and then just return, yes it is. I haven't edited any config files, I haven't drug any controls around, I've just created this new thing. And I go and run that and say slash home slash this is cool. There's a convention in the way the routing works. So the name of that method automatically became something I could address with a URL. I didn't add a new page, I simply added a new method. And it's on the home controller and the this is cool method. Notice that I had it return a string and then I just returned the string and it automatically output that. There's a number of different actions that you can take when your controller goes and does something. This one is just a content action. Later on we'll add views and make things a little bit more complicated. But it's important to point out that your application can literally be as simple as that. This is the controller. You'll notice though, if I put a breakpoint here and hit F5 to debug, and I'm going to hit the index page, immediately that breakpoint gets hit. We're loading our symbols here over the internet. This breakpoint is set on the home controller on the index method. When I visit that, I end up here. So immediately after hitting slash home slash index, or in this case the default, I show up there. This is called a front controller model. If you're familiar with web forms, that's a page controller. You have like a page load. In this case, the controller is in the front. So remember those three boxes, and where does that circle start? Well, it starts at the controller. The URL is routed to the controller. The controller then does some stuff, talks to a database, talks to a web service, and then takes that information, packages it up, hands it to a view, and then that view creates the HTML or whatever you want to create. So the controller talks to the model, the model sends information to the view, the view has links which then cause the controller, and that's why we see that circle of model view controller. To put it visually, a request comes in through the routing and is sent to controller. By default, by default, the routing is set such that slash controller slash action, home slash about, or Scott slash do something. The controller then talks to a model, could be a database, could be anything, could be a file, does some stuff. The controller is the, where most of the work happens. Then, the view then visually represents that model. We'll talk more in detail about that in a little bit. 
visually represents that, sends back the response. The response may then contain forms or links and things like that, and then the cycle continues. By default, when I make a site in MVC, there's a number of pre-installed packages using a thing called NuGet, and we'll talk more about NuGet in the talk this afternoon, but it's a package management system that allows us to snap pieces into ASP.NET MVC. By default, we include packages like jQuery for JavaScript support on the client side, a thing called Modernizer from Paul Iris and the folks at Google that let us work with HTML5 on older browsers, and we now ship with MVC Entity Framework 4.1, what's also called Entity Framework Code First, and that allows us to make a model. Let's go and create a model. We've got a model folder, a views folder, and a controllers folder. We've got our default model for logging in. I'm just going to go and say add class. We'll say a person class. And I will give a person a ID. And I'll give him a first name. And I'll give him a last name. And I'll give him a birth date. What I'm doing there is I'm typing prop, which is called a snippet. I hit tab, tab, date, time, tab, tab, birth date, enter. That's a really quick way for me to start to describe what I want things to look like. I'm going to use the entity framework. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But I need a database context. I'm going to be describing my database using code first. Entity framework is one of the ways that you can talk to a database with MVC. You can do database first, where you create it in SQL Server. You can do model first, where you design it in a visual designer. Or you can do code first. They all roll up into the same view of the data and ultimately are equally performant. They're all fast regardless of what you decide to do. I like code first because I think it's an easy way to describe what will eventually turn into a table. I'm going to make a class here. We'll call it uh, person context, and it's going to be a DB context. DB context comes from another namespace. I just hit control period, and it's going to bring in a using statement. So if you look at the top of the screen on line five, that just appears. And we're going to have a public set of persons and we'll call them people. So our little database that does not yet exist has person, more than one person is called people, and I'm going to want to create some people. Well, I can go and create a new controller. There's a lot of options in here, but I'm going to actually make a controller with empty actions. Don't want to make it too easy to start with, and then we'll dig into other ways that we can do this, and we'll call it a person controller, and hit add. I could also have made that manually. Doing it this way gave me index, details, create, edit, delete. So by default, I got some of the things that I might want to need to create a person. First thing we'll do is actually create someone. From within this method, which is just a, a, a method, there's nothing fancy here, there's no config file behind it, I can actually right-click and select Add View. This is part of the tooling. I could do it manually, or I could use this little tool to make it for me. I could say, I want to create a view called Create, and I know that this is going to be about persons. I'm going to create a person. So I'm strongly typing this. I'm associating this view with this object. We are going to create persons or people. And I can choose from a built-in template. And you can customize these templates as well. I'll say create a person. We'll hit add. On the right-hand side, right there, a create just showed up. Notice how just as there was a hierarchy for routing, slash home, slash about, was the home controller and the about method, views are laid out a similar way. You see that there's a home folder, now we have a person folder and a create view. So there is already by default a convention. I have a person controller and a create method, I now have a person view and a create view associated with it. That view is using a new thing called Razor. We'll talk a little bit about Razor in a moment. What that little generator did is it just looked at a person and it put out first 
last birth date for me automatically, including a submit button. And it's going to post that form to slash person slash create. Now by default, let's just try running this, and see what we've got going. Slash person slash create. I got a nice little form. If I hit create, it tells me that birth date is required. If I try to create something though, it says, well, I don't know what to do. I could look in index, but I'm really confused what you're asking me to do. So what we really need is to do something. That create, when we hit slash person slash create, is going to fill out the form and then post the information back. So we see the difference between a get, where we got the form, and a post, where we go back to either the same URL or another one. So here we're going to create another create method, except this one responds to a post. So the routing is not just about the URL, it's also about whether I'm going to get something or post something. And in fact, I'm going to do things a little bit different. I'm going to have it take a person, and get rid of all this here, make this a little bit simpler. So when I create a person uh, here, we're going to say, uh, I think we called it person context, call it DB for database equals new person context. Say DB dot people dot add person, db dot people dot, uh, excuse me, db dot save changes rather. And then we will return, redirect back to the index. So we would go and create somebody, add them to our database, which doesn't exist yet, and then go back to show some list. A couple of things interesting that are going on here. When we generated this little bit of razor code, we see these helpers that start with an at sign. Here this says, I need a label to show first name. I need an editor to show a text box for first name. I need last. This is all using the razor syntax. Razor syntax is actually new in MVC3, and it is a really lightweight and clean way to present HTML because it makes it simpler to switch back and forth between HTML and code. It's a more natural mix of code and markup. This is a good way to look at it. At the top, we see how web forms would output a for loop. Typically, these are called uh, bee stings. You see that open uh, um, less than sign percent, then some code, and then we close it. So there's actually six transitions in markup just to do a for loop and output a couple of lines. This is really simple stuff. Now in PHP, we mark the whole thing as a code block and then we have an echo. So there's only two markup transitions. It's a little bit cleaner. But with Razor, we can do two markup um, transitions just using the at sign. When I first saw Razor, I thought it was going to be really complicated. I thought I'd have to learn a new language. Razor is not a new language. It's the same Visual Basic or C Sharp that you already know mixed in with HTML. It's a syntax rather than a language. So if you stop thinking about it as a language, you'll find that you actually already know it. You basically just put at instead of, inside of anything that is going to be some code, and it automatically knows what to do. You'll notice there at the bottom where we say li at i, we don't have to close that because the system already knows that an and a variable called i doesn't have a less than. It intuitively knows that this is a transition and does it for us. So it's many times simpler than, uh, than doing web forms for the kinds of things we want to do. You can really move from code to markup easily. You can have blocks of HTML. You can explicitly use a markup thing called text to say that this is text and I don't want to output any kind of div. Or you can output a single line in markup using the at sign with a colon. 
really simple. Let's go and create a couple more views and it'll make uh, even more sense. If I create a person, I can't actually show them yet. So I'm going to go back up to index. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, use that person context, which I'm now going to move out of this method and make it more global. And we'll get more and more advanced as we move forward. And I'm going to say uh, people equals db dot people dot to list. And I'm going to pass that person into the view. Here I'm actually getting it from the database and passing it into the view explicitly. I'm going to right click and say add view. And we're going to create another view, except this time rather than create, we'll make a list of things. This could be done manually, but a little bit of generation makes life easier. Notice here that this view knows that it has a model. It's a view that's custom for people. This view, the index view, only knows about people objects. There's other more advanced things that you can do. You can make views dynamic. But here, I enumerable of person. That means I have a list of person. We looked at that object and made first, last, and birth date automatically. And then we've got a table of that stuff. Notice the for each on line 26. It's just nice and clean. It's just at, start the for each, and then you don't have to close it. It handles it for you. And one thing I'm going to do before I uh, get any farther is I'm going to try to provide a little bit more information to my model because this is going to eventually become a database. Now remember when I hit create, I got an error that said birth date is not there. But I didn't get any other errors. I didn't, it didn't say that first name was required. It didn't say last name was required because strings don't have to have any information in them. So I'm actually going to put a little attribute on first and say you are required. And I can even say you should be less than 30 characters. And I'll take those and put them on first and last. So now I'm putting little, little post-it notes, little sticky notes in the form of .NET attributes on first, last, and birth date. That information is going to be in one place in the code, in the code first model, but it's going to fan out and be used in multiple places that we're going to see in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and uh, run this. And we'll hit slash person. There's our index view. Now notice that I've been talking about databases and saying lots of stuff about databases, but I haven't mentioned anything about what database or where it is or connection strings or anything. So by default, the entity framework is going to do the right thing. It's going to try to help you get your project done quickly, and then you can update with more information later. So here, I've already got index, Scott, Hanselman, one, twenty-two, nineteen. Okay. Create. And I put. Where did it go? Where is that information? I've just created a create and a list. Well, if I go into SQL Server Management Studio and hit refresh, it automatically created the database for me, automatically looking at SQL Express, which was installed in my machine. I didn't tell it the name of the database, so rather than not working, it made up one for me. Inside that, it actually created a people database. Notice that it figured out that you named it ID, so it must be an ID and a primary key. You marked them as required and length 30, so they are required and length 30. And a birth date was not done as a nullable date time, so that's also required. So I set it in one place and it fanned out into the database. Where else does that information uh, exist? And by the way, I can also confirm that the data is in there. SQL Server people might freak out and say that, well, I lost control. This is bad for me and my job. But remember, database first, that's cool. Model first, that's fine. And code first. It's all the same thing. And if you don't want to use the Entity Framework, you can use Link to SQL or nHibernate or Dapper or Massive or any number of really great database systems out there, whatever makes you happy. So the M in MVC 
while we give it to you by default with Entity Framework 4.1, is totally up to you. I'll show you other ways that we can make that even easier. Now, if I click on Details, notice, and let's make this easier for me to show you guys. Notice if I hover over Details, the link down here says slash person slash details slash one. So now we've gone from home slash about to controller slash action slash something else. Because if I'm going to have multiple persons, I might want to view their details pages. So we're going to be passing information into that. First, let's go and look at the index page and see how that's getting output. Look on line 39. We're specifically saying, I want an action link. I want a link to go somewhere. Some people hard code their URLs. They would actually hard code slash person slash details and then concatenate on the ID. But you can have a little more flexibility if you say, just give me a link to the action. You figure out the URL. You can pass in multiple parameters. In this example, I'm passing an ID. But your URLs can be as complicated or as simple as you like. So HTML action link, we've got one for edit, details, and delete. If I switch back over here and do a view source, that is this. Make sense? So what happens if I click on that link? I hit slash person slash details, but then it says the view details cannot be found. What's going on there? Well, let's go look at details. Here we said return view. It automatically figured that you didn't say a specific view, so it must be details because that's the name of your method. This is this kind of ongoing convention over configuration. Old school Microsoft, there'd probably be an XML file somewhere that you'd have to update. New school Microsoft, we're trying to look at some of the more modern frameworks like Rails and Django that use this convention over configuration. It's sometimes a little bit simpler. Let's go and say d, uh, var person equals db dot uh, people dot find id. Pass in person. Right click, add view. Make one that is details. Hit add. Notice that in the Solution Explorer, we now have a growing collection of views. If we look at the details view, we see that it also is strongly typed. Remember that the list view was typed to list of person, innumerable bunch of people. And this one here says, I know about just person. But we're passing in additional information here. Not only can you strongly type a view and say, this object has this associated view, but you also have a bag of stuff that you can put things in. It's called view bag. It's a dynamic object. I could come here and say, uh, in details, view bag dot. You notice that I don't get any IntelliSense. I don't get any friendly help. That's because that's a dynamic object. Some people say, well, that's weird. C Sharp is a static language. How do you have dynamic also? Well, we do. This is statically typed as dynamic. It's a true story. So I can say whatever I want here, because the operation will be resolved at runtime. I can throw anything I want in there. Is that going to compile? Of course it will. And then later on, I can bring that information out. Using just like Razor. So this way I can have the benefits of a strongly typed view. So I can have IntelliSense for things like model dot, um, do, do, let me go back down here. Model dot first, model dot last. But I can also have the benefits of dynamic. Let's go ahead and run our application. 
visit person again. Here's our list of them. Now I've got a details page. So you're seeing how we're starting to slowly create, uh, create, read, update, and delete. Now let's go and do edit. We'll back over here. Actually, one thing I want to point out though, in person controller, when we did create, how did everything show up here in person? How did a person actually happen? We'll see a little bit more of that in, in edit. We'll go down into edit. By default, edit needs to just get the uh, current object, db people find id var person equals, and we'll pass him in. And then he'll need to take back a post. So here we'll go and say add view, edit. There's our view for editing. And then here I'll take a person again. And let's see here. Do, do, do. We'll have him go back to the index. So once we've edited, we'll be able to go back and see that information. And then here we'll say db.entry. We'll pass in our person. And we'll say that his state is now modified. And then save the changes. I'll hit a breakpoint right there. We'll hit F5. Actually, yeah, yeah, we'll hit F5 to debug that. We'll hit slash person. I've got symbol debugging turned on, so it's actually trying to load a bunch of symbols over our internet connection. We'll see more about that later. Maybe not the smartest thing I've ever done. I think we've got a 2400 baud modem that we're using in the back that's making that happen for me. It's either a 2400 baud modem or it's two guys that are just holding the bits up with their fingers and they're sending them across like that. Yeah, that's a bad idea. Remember the definition of insanity is trying the same thing and expecting a different result. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Tools, options, debugging, symbols. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. I tried. <laughs> You're clapping for slow internet. Thank you. First clapping for slow internet. That was great. I'm about ready to tether my phone here and pay $20 a megabyte just to sip this through a straw from America. I'm going to hit, hit edit here. Here's my edit. Edit's a lot like create, except it goes back somewhere different. Scott is much younger than I am. And uh, I'm going to hit view source and just point out briefly that these text boxes are named the same as the objects themselves. So we've got a ID equals last, ID equals first. When I hit save, how does it know? Well, in web forms, typically you, you dig around, you say request.form last, request.form, and it becomes very boring. Boring things are a good opportunity for the computer to do the work for you. One of the things that we talked about a little bit in the keynote is some of the, the boring code that happened in the original classic ASP, and it was mostly what I call left-hand, right-hand code, where this hand pulls out of request.query string and request.form, and the other hand shoves it into the object. That's boring. But if we have a convention, in this example, where the form post name value pairs, 
first equals Scott, last equals Guthrie, lines up nicely into the objects, we can bind the object to the HTTP post itself automatically. And all that left hand, right hand kind of boring monkey code happens for you. We're bringing model binding to web forms. And as I made that point in the keynote that don't always blame the technology, there are things that can be done that can make it much more interesting. You'd be surprised how fun web forms is when you don't have to dig around and request dot this and request dot that. And that also underscores the point that I made before that it's all ASP.NET. Things are moving back and forth. Things like required and string length that you're seeing in MVC now, that was done originally in, M in web forms and dynamic data. Things like model binding that you see first in MVC, those things are moving over to web forms. So you're going to see fun uh, new techniques for making programming uh, more enjoyable, switching back and forth between the different technologies, because it's all ASP.NET underneath. So now I've got create, de details, edit. I didn't do delete, but I'll skip that because it's boring. One of the things that is interesting, though, is I marked that uh, validation information. Remember when I was over in person before and I said things like required and string length? And I made the point that you want that information in one place. People say that this is dry. The irony of dry and explaining it in a presentation is that dry means don't repeat yourself, which I've now done like three times. So dry means don't repeat yourself, and you want your code to be as dry as possible. You want to say required string length 30 one time, have it go into the database, have it be used on server-side validation, and have it be used on the client side. So how is that happening? I've said 30 once. I can right-click and say view source and take a look here. I pointed out briefly when I created the project that it's HTML5. But not every aspect of HTML5 is supported by every browser. Turns out that HTML5 isn't really something that you can point at and say, that's HTML5. It's a collection of things. One of those things in the collection of things that is in HTML5 is the data convention for attributes. Notice how we're saying here, data val equals true, data val length equals, in this case, 30. Notice our validation required information, that's all sitting on the input box itself. It's moved from the attribute in .NET into the HTML. But where's the JavaScript to do that work? Well, this is a nice clean little page of only about 100 lines, or actually looks like it's even less, 75 lines. There's no JavaScript. Because people who are doing more advanced web applications like to do what's called unobtrusive and non-inline JavaScript, all of that's being handled by what's called jQuery unobtrusive validation. Unobtrusive means it's not in your face. And that's actually on by default in MVC3. And I think it's funny because unobtrusive is a word, but I don't think obtrusive is a word, so they've named it unobtrusive JavaScript enabled, as opposed to maybe obtrusive JavaScript disabled, or totally nasty JavaScript on, or any number of things. So I'm gonna say unobtrusive JavaScript enabled false, and uh, go back here and look at my application again, and see the difference. The obtrusive stuff is all of this. This is the older way of doing things. This is a JavaScript array, except it's emitted in line. It says the exact same thing, and the only difference is I have turned one thing off and we've emitted something else. This speaks to the fact that MVC3 really is pluggable. You can plug in pieces to act different ways. Here we've got the choice for our validation methods in one place, and notice that they are no longer on our input boxes. Or I can go back here, run it again after turning it back on. And now I've seen that that has moved to the new unobtrusive or 
classy JavaScript. I guess I would call that awesome JavaScript. That is part of the validation stuff. Now, one thing that I wish I could do is see where it says birth date here. I kind of feel like that should use some more, uh, some more JavaScript because JavaScript is the big thing actually right now. And you know what might even be more interesting is to talk a little bit about Ajax and then we'll bring in some, uh, some jQuery. This model binding that we've seen where one can post an HTML form and automatically turn it into an object also applies to JavaScript. So I'm going to go and just make a little spike here on the side. We'll make a uh, Ajax example controller. We'll make it empty. And uh, uh, do, do, do. we'll say um, create a person, we'll say. Person. And then I believe I hid this over here earlier in the interest of time. Because again, you know that I can type pretty well. I'm actually unable to drag things from the toolbox, but I'm actually quite a competent typer. So here I've made a little Ajax example controller. Doesn't look like anything fancy. Doesn't matter what it was named. And I've got a method called you know, update person. And let's bring in a view for that. We'll create a index view. And we'll drag that guy in. So this is just an Ajax example. There's nothing, nothing fancy going on here. We've got no form though. We've just got an input box that I wrote manually and then a bunch of text boxes for each of my objects. And I've got a little div at the bottom for some message. Then I can write some jQuery. This is all client side. So this JavaScript is going to say when you click on the save button, go and grab the value inside of first, last, and birth date, and then post that information to slash Ajax example slash update person. And if that works out, then update this message and say, sweet, that worked. So now, rather than posting HTML forms, we're going to be posting Ajax and we're doing it on the client side. But it's still a person. Why is it a person? Because it's shaped like a person. People have first, lasts, and birth dates. Let's go back in here, run our application, go to Ajax example. Put in some stuff. Hit save. Hover over person. And there it is. So there's model binding again, except what was different. Well, we sent JavaScript this time, but it was shaped like a person, so we deserialized the JSON and automatically put it in there. Model binding is extremely customizable and really easy to use. I wanted to point that out because the controller looks the same. There's nothing about JavaScript in the controller. The model binder that provides those values automatically did the right thing. And then the result comes back. I'll do that again. Watch at the bottom there. Test Jones. I need to turn my breakpoint off so you can see that actually happened. I suck. I hope that's a year. See? So we didn't actually go and get a new page. We did that all on the client side in JavaScript and that kind of Gmail way of doing things. So that's an example of using JavaScript rather than HTML. Something that I might want to do to make things more interesting for my create is to maybe make a uh, date time picker. So that would be nicer. Now when I do something like that, 
Um, I want to use jQuery, which ships with ASP.NET MVC. But I know that in HTML5, they've already got support for this. They're supposed to have this input type equals date. If we look at any of our um, forms in our application, all of these things are actually input type equals text. So for example, here's birth date, type equals text. And there's supposed to be new, th new stuff like phone number and email and number and you know, all that kind of stuff in, in HTML5. So what I can do, pointing out that here, I'm saying editor for birth date. I'm not saying text box for. I'm leaving it out in the open. I'm saying to MVC, figure it out. Give me something that looks like it ought to work for a date time. And it says, well, all I know to do is a text box, so it gave me a text box. Well, I can use the new package management system, and I can go up, and I know that there is an, uh, and I'm going to plug back in, actually. hope it works. There's actually an open source uh, tool out there called MVC HTML5 templates. Uh, MVC HTML5. Templates. Go and find that information online. There it is. Watch the right hand side on the Solution Explorer over here under Views. I was hoping that would pop open. But what we ended up getting was down here under Shared, we got new templates, new editor templates that are specific to different data types, all the new stuff that's in HTML5, colors and URLs and weeks and stuff like that. If I go and look at one of those, they literally are just overrides. Someone says, well, I want a text box with a date time type instead of the standard one. This means not only can you put in HTML5 templates, but this editor templates folder here allows you to put other things. You could make... Um, the object that's specific to your business. I could make a person editor template, and person could then use these. So you can actually stack and create extremely reusable components that know how to display views. So for example, I've got create and edit, and they're basically copies of each other, aren't they? First, last, birth date, first, last, birth, two places. We'll see later how I can make that a little bit simpler. So if I do this, and then run my application, Go check out person create. You see how my person box, my birth date box is really wide. Looks kind of weird. It's not styled correctly. I'll switch back over to my CSS. I'll look for input. And I'll add in date time. Now it looks right. But when I click in it, nothing happens. So that means that IE doesn't support HTML5 uh, date time stuff because it's not something that's been kind of a standardized. But I know that the, the one and only browser that does is Opera. And they make this kind of funky looking one where this button is square and this button is rounded and that's cut off. But, you know, it's cool that they have that. So what I want is to say, if you support this, cool. Otherwise, give me this experience. Chrome and Firefox don't support that. IE9 doesn't support that. But you get the idea. So HTML9 isn't this nice kind of layer. It's actually kind of this craggy ups and downs. Some things work, some things don't. So I need to kind of clean that and level the playing field. That's one of the reasons that we are shipping Modernizer, which allows us to write to HTML5, but have it work in, in other browsers. So we already have... Um, we already have J um, jQuery on our system. This won't necessarily be a best, a best practice here, but I will, uh, I'll show you anyway. Let's do this. Let's go to our main layout page. You see lines six, seven, and eight there. We've got some CSS and some, some jQuery. I could, I could drag in jQuery UI, which might be interesting, but I might want to actually load it conditionally, maybe only load it if I need it. So then all I really need then is some CSS for the date picker. And then I know that I need a specific theme because my date picker has to look like something. 
there is one on a line called Redmond. This actually shows that you can use the NuGet package management system to bring down not just DLLs, not just JavaScript, but also CSS and all sorts of other things. So I just brought back that CSS file, which I'll now drag in here. So what I want to do is I want to say, if your browser supports date time, cool. Else, load jQuery and put a date picker there. The code is surprisingly easy to read. If not modernizer.inputtypes.date, where modernizer is this JavaScript library, this great library that lets me interrogate the browser and say, do you support the video tag? Do you support date time? Do you support color? Da, 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 da. It's called progressive enhancement, feature enablement. You hear these terms. You don't want to say, if you're Netscape, do that. If you're Opera, do this. I don't care what browser you have. I care what your browser can do. So here we're saying, if your browser can't do dates, go and dynamically load jQuery UI. And then take anything that looks like an input box of type date time and make it a date picker. Let's go ahead and do that. Refresh. Now I've got a date picker, and I'm using HTML5 and date, and it still works in Opera using their native date picker. So everybody wins. I used NuGet to bring that information down, and I used editor templates in order to change that. If you were doing this uh, in like web forms today and your boss said, can you make all the dates act differently, you'd need to go and update all those controls in multiple places. But MVC has a little bit more of a dry way of thinking about things and I can actually modify all dates or all URLs or even make custom ones. So the data types can be associated with views like this and we can keep things as clean as possible. So, so far, what we've ended up doing is creating a nice little create, read, update, delete system, except we, uh, we did it all manually, but now we know how it works. We saw model binding, we saw URL linking, we saw jQuery and JavaScript, we saw how you can post HTML forms and they turn into a person, we talked how I can post JSON and it turns into a person. But as with all uh, good teaching, you have to show children how to suffer and then you told them, here's the trick for long division and you never have to do it again, here's a calculator. So rather than doing it manually, there's a lot of new stuff in MVC3 that will make it easier. MVC3 released in January. But we just updated, not MVC3, but the tooling, those dialogues that I've been using, add controller and add view, we've updated that. It's a tooling update that came out just a couple weeks ago at Mix. That means specifically there are no changes in MVC3. You don't need to update your servers or do anything. This is just developer convenience stuff. So if you look at your add remove programs, the only difference, wait for it, boom, it's right there. Very, very simple update, gives you some new tools, not a big deal. But what do those tools do? Well, there's a bunch of new stuff new in MVC3. We've seen the Razor View engine. You can do multiple view engines now. You can have Razor, or Web Forms, or something else. You saw some of the validation stuff that we did with unobtrusive. Uh, we can talk about more advanced things at another time, like dependency injection. We've also seen that all the libraries are using jQuery. But in the tooling update, not only do we get the pre-installed NuGet packages, but also scaffolding in an extensible way via NuGet and HTML5 project templates. So, let's do this. Let's say, I'm gonna delete, uh, how should I do this? I don't know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna delete person controller, I'm gonna delete all of my people, I'm gonna delete Ajax exam, I'm just gonna torch this whole thing. I probably should just make a new project, but that's because I'm not very clever. <clears throat> And let's say add controller. Um, I'll say person controller. Except now I'm going to say, give me a controller with read write actions with person and you know, make me a new data context. Or in this case, use the existing one inside of 
the person class and hit add. Watch the right hand side. It's creating person, it's creating create, read, update, delete for me. So now that last uh, 45 minutes of your life that you're not gonna get back, but aren't you better people? We just regenerated that all except we did it all automatically. But wait, that's not all. Do you guys have those people on the commercials? They wanna sell you something for 19 euro and then they say, no, no, but wait, that's all. If you order today, you'll get two, two scaffolding systems. Check this out. We can say add library package and we can actually bring in another one. It's called MVC scaffolding. Install package, I can do it from the command line. We'll see a lot of detail in the in-depth talk on NuGet that we'll see later. I'm gonna say MVC scaffolding. It's gonna go and bring those packages down. And then now, I'm gonna delete person controller again. I'm going to delete person again. And I'm gonna say add controller. And see this t drop down we've been looking at? You can get in there too. Everything in MVC is extensible, even the dialog boxes like this. Anywhere you see a drop down box, you can get in there. So now I'm gonna use someone else's scaffolding, in this case, Steve Sanderson's, who is one of our uh, awesome uh, program managers, and I'm gonna hit add. And now we're gonna go and generate stuff using Steve Sanderson's generator. And he's gonna be a little bit more sophisticated because he can update this all the time. He can extend it, he can add new information. His is a little bit more interesting. He's created not just create, edit, and delete. Remember when I pointed out how I was feeling a little bit not dry about the create form and the edit form looking so similar? Well, he cleverly created create or edit and made that a partial. So now anytime I need a bunch of text boxes that describe what a person looks like, he's got that. So then if I look at create, what does create say? Look at line 17. Now we have a partial view. So try to put all of this together now in your mind. You've got strongly typed views. You can also pass in dynamic information. Those views are nested in larger layouts, like what we call master pages or layouts. So layouts have views. Views can have partial views. In this case, he's pulled out just all those text boxes and now shares them so the code's not repeated anywhere. And those views themselves, like create or edit, can use things like editor for rather than saying text box for. And when he says, I want an editor for birth date, that'll say, well, it's a date time. Do we have anyone who can handle date time? So suddenly we have master pages, views, partials, and specific editors. It becomes a really, really clean and reusable way to make large and complicated forms. And it's actually a lot of fun and I, and, uh, I enjoy it myself quite a bit. Let's uh, take a look at a couple of more things that I can show you. Um, let's do, 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 let's do action filters. This is a good example. The, the routing stuff that we saw inside of the global ASA also includes something called global action filters or the concept of action filters themselves. Each of these objects, like the person controller, is getting called directly, but I might want to have other what are called cross-cutting concerns, things that need to happen all the time, filters for authorization. I might want to be able to say, uh, this is only for people who are authorized or I think it's called require HTTPS. This controller method only is secure. But what if I wanted to go and make my own? I can make a new folder, I'll just call it filters. And we'll put a class in there. We'll make it like log filter. I'll make a log filter attribute and I think it's called uh, action filter attribute and I action filter. And I'll override. And I can get in on actions that are either happening or just happened. And I can say, I want this to happen every time an action is executing or maybe just after it executed. And maybe I want to do something like tracing. Trace dot 
right line, and then say that something happened. Uh, they're passing in some information to me. I could say something like filter context. What happened? Well, I want to action descriptor, the name of the action that's currently happening. Maybe I'll say, just ran this. And that'll happen as tracing output. Now that log filter then can be put on an action or on a controller or I could make it global. So I could go in, go in here and say filters.add new log filter attribute. And now that's going to happen always. So you get a lot of control, not just about what particular actions are getting called, but what gets involved. You can have logging and authorization and all sorts of great stuff. Now if I go and run that, things are running, but I'm not actually seeing any of that tracing information, which is unfortunate. I could go and look at trace.axd or figure out ways to look at tracing, but there's a really great new tool that just came out called Glimpse. And Glimpse is an open source tool that you plug in to MVC, and I'll say install package Glimpse, to give you a glimpse, a bit of debugging. It's kind of like Firebug, if you're familiar with Firebug or the F12 developer tools in IE9, except it's not a plugin. It's not a browser plugin. It's actually done entirely in JavaScript and jQuery with modules on the server side. So I'm going to say glimpse slash config and turn it on. I've set a cookie. It's not something that ships with MVC, but it's a great example of the open source community doing something amazing. Now you see the all-seeing eye of glimpse is now in the corner of my page. I'm going to click on that, and this thing pops up. And then I freak out because I think it's a plugin. But then I realize if I just select the text, it's JavaScript and jQuery and it's a div. And then I bow before the awesomeness that is the person that wrote this. I can look at things like execution. This is a great way to learn about how ASP.NET MVC works or web forms. Notice my app settings like unobtrusive JavaScript, I can actually see that. I can see my SQL Server connection strings. But remember that tracing that we put in? I can see that too. So it's extremely, extremely powerful when you start plugging these Lego pieces together in a very, very useful way. So what we've seen so far is we've seen how controllers, models, and views work. We saw how Razor works, how you can nest site layouts, views, partial views, and editor templates. We saw how it's easy to go and make a CRUD site, create, read, update, delete. Model binding means you don't have to dig around in the HTTP request or deserialize JSON objects. Working with AJAX is just as easy as working with HTML forms. We saw how even though it's easy in just a few minutes to make an entire site, once you know how that works and how those objects work, then you can go and generate that. In fact, you can take that generation code and change it and generate your own code. You can generate code that works entirely differently. You can make code that is specific to your project. You can generate AJAX grids or forms that look entirely different. Everything is open to you with MVC3. If you don't like something, change it. I would encourage you to check out ASP.NET slash MVC. And if you want information about MVC3 specifically, ASP.NET slash MVC slash MVC3. Check that out. And there's lots of videos, free books. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been Scott Hanselman, and I'll be talking about NuGet later this afternoon. Bye-bye.